Okie dokie. So we've got Michael and Steve all the way from Luxembourg. So thank you very much, guys, for making all the way out here. Um, can we give them a warm round of applause? They're going to be going through a, a threat sharing platform, which they will be describing shortly. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for being here. I, uh, I am Steve Clements. I am indeed uh, all the way from uh, Tokyo, actually, which is where I am currently based. But I am initially from Luxembourg, and Michael is my uh, teammate from Circle Luxembourg. And we will be talking this morning about a little threat intelligence sharing platform called MISP, which uh, some of you might know. This will not be a very technical talk. I hope it will be an interesting talk. Um, I will sort of underline a certain, a certain aspects of the platform. And then finally, Michael will show us uh, some, some real life features that have been uh, recently implemented to make uh, threat sharing a little bit easier. Um, we are from uh, the uh, Computer Incident Response Center in Luxembourg, um, and we are uh, not selling you anything. Uh, we are talking about free and open source software here, and um, our main goal during this presentation will also be to uh, motivate you uh, to share your indicators of compromise. So um, if, if anything, it, it should really get you uh, started thinking about, OK, um, what do I have I can actually share with a community at large? Um, I'm a security analyst for Circle, as I said, and Michael is... Hi, I'm Michael Hamm, and uh, I work mainly in the field of incidents response and in forensic analysis. Okay, now, now we got it. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get started. Um, how did MISP come to be? Uh, basically, back in 2012, there was a, uh, a malware researcher at the Ministry of Defense of Belgium who, uh, who was reversing a, a, piece of, a piece of software, and uh, he noticed that he was not alone. And um, as a matter of fact, quite a few people uh, reversed this particular uh, malware, and he had no means of sharing his findings in a unified and easy way, apart from uh, sending uh, random emails around and, and just like tweeting and stuff like that. So he thought, okay, I need a tool. And he uh, fixed his problem by uh, developing a tool called the, the Malware Information Sharing Platform. Uh, ever since then, um, MISP has been born. And because in the beginning MISP was a NATO project, um, after a while the funding dried up. Um, one of the more, more common questions we get is, okay, why is, is, Circle, is Circle MISP? What, what is Circle doing in, uh, uh, in, in this equation? Well, we basically didn't want, want to let this particular piece of software die. So uh, we got together with NATO and we told them, okay, open source the platform and we will take care of, uh, of fostering the community and the developers uh, behind and uh, around, around MISP. And ever since then, it is a community-driven uh, project where anyone and everyone can participate uh, if they wish so. Um, for people who speak a little bit of legalese, it is a, a dual GPL license, which means that um, the uh, core and everything around is, is GPL licensed. And then plus, if you make a contribution, you get also a personal license, which means if we want to change the license of MISP, we have to ask all our 1,500 plus contributors to change the license. This is a uh, mechanism to avoid commercializing MISP because we do not want the software to go to commercial. So it's a bit of a, uh, of a, of a full scar. Um, why do, uh, why, why do you need a platform like MISP? Well, because there uh, is not much in that realm out there. Apart from the big vendors, uh, there are no open, easy to use platforms that are in some kind standardized. Because that was one of the other uh, big things we noticed is that there are no real 
there are no uh, there are no dictionaries out there, so we all talk the same thing. There are no uh, proper exchange formats that can uh, talk on a machine level between uh, between machines. Um, for fans of Stix out there, Stix One is dead. Um, long live Stix Two. Uh, Stix One is awful. It's an XML container. It was kind of broken from the beginning, and we did not want to use uh, that. Thus, we uh, created our own MIS format, which uh, also everyone can contribute to. Um, who uses MISP? Uh, mainly uh, information security people, but it, is, uh, it can be tailored to, uh, to any sector. Um, currently, we sort of uh, have, uh, have been approached by the, uh, by the financial sector, because there's a lot of fra fraud going on, and uh, thus quite a few features have made their way into MISP to make uh, the financial uh, uh, sector um, more, to basically make the indicators of financial sector might share more compatible with, uh, with MISP. Quite a few law enforcement agencies also use it to uh, share um, not only indicators of compromise, but also indicators of, uh, of persons, um, because that is also something that you can, uh, that you can do. Um, intelligence analysts, of course, uh, as well. And um, another thing that is really great with the, with the platform is that anything that goes uh, into MISP or anything that gets developed in MISP has always automation in mind. Um, it is, for us, one of the, of, of, of the ultimate goals to expose everything to our API on the back end so, so that um, you, you can just include it in your uh, security tool chain at any level. Um, and thus, uh, all the information that gets uh, put in can also easily come out um, and, and basically talk to your, uh, to your appliances in the, in the back end. Uh, a few words on the uh, model of governance. Um, we have a core project team that kind of uh, decides what really goes into, uh, into MISP uh, because the core is an information exchange platform, and that is it. And that will uh, be uh, the core for forever. Anything else, any sugar around it, will be in form of a module or an extension or a Python script, so that uh, the core can, first of all, be uh, secure, uh, you can keep a certain uh, overview, and, um, and um, also with open source projects where you have a lot of external contributors, uh, you, you, might, you might want to uh, keep an eye on, on what people actually do contribute. Uh, we have quite a lot of trainings where development uh, gets, uh, gets pushed along. Um, our goal usually is during a training to, to find edge cases or to find, uh, to find bugs with, uh, with the people we, uh, we have as, um, uh, in, in, our, in our training sessions. Once a year, we have a summit where the uh, communities come together and uh, basically discuss what the future of MISP should be, whether uh, we are still on the right track or whether we should put ourselves uh, in question in terms of, of anything uh, around our information sharing uh, platform. Our main communication channels uh, is besides uh, sometimes email, actually GitHub, where you can easily open uh, issues and uh, even ask cert a certain amount of support questions uh, surrounding uh, the, the software. We also use something called Gitter, which is a chat uh, extension to GitHub, if you want, so where you can discuss any uh, developments that go on within, within MISP. The core project is written mainly in PHP, using a uh, little framework called CakePHP. This is historical. One of the lead developers uh, was, uh, and still is, an excellent PHP developer. And um, who would have known that if you have uh, enough uh, passion, brains, and uh, a sense for security, even PHP can be secure. So um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe in the beginning, PHP was a, a catastrophe, but Come on, it's been uh, more than 10 years, or I don't even know how long ago PHP got actually invented. Um, but a lot of it is also written in Python 3. 
Uh, why Python uh, 3? Well, first of all, Python 2 is dead. Uh, Python 3 is the way to go. And um, it, it gives you an, uh, uh, an, an outstanding flexibility in, uh, in, in just writing your own code uh, if you want to quickly extend uh, MISP uh, in, its, in its functionalities. Um, it's a language that is uh, rather accessible, so we wanted to keep it as easy as possible for people to get started on, uh, on, on hacking uh, some modules in, um, in MISP. A couple of uh, neat features as well. Uh, false positives are a huge problem if you have a lot of data, and uh, with that, the warning lists have been born, where basically uh, you have uh, a lot of little JSON files that describe which attributes uh, the system should be uh, warning about. Um, for instance, if you have a Google IP address, there is a JSON warning list for all the common uh, Google attributes, you will get a warning, okay, careful, you're just now submitting an indicator um, that might be bad if you push it to your, um, to your firewall. Uh, the, one of the newest additions uh, are the notice lists, and a notice list is similar to a warning list, but it basically also checks attributes, categories, and objects. Um, Michael's going to talk a little bit uh, about objects later on, but the notice lists are mostly for compliance issues. Um, you might have heard of GDPR, and all of a sudden uh, we had to think about uh, being GDPR compliant. In our view, we are GDPR compliant. Uh, we actually have uh, written a small paper about it, why we think that is so. Why do I say we think? Well, because it's very new. There are no, uh, there's no case law yet, so we will see. Hopefully someone sues us to actually make a point whether we are GDPR compliant or not. Otherwise, laws make no sense. Um, but mostly um, with the GDPR notice list, if you enter any uh, personally identifiable information, you get uh, a certain warning again. It basically flashes red and says, careful, there is uh, something GDPR related in your event. Um, and that can be extended because it's a fairly simple uh, JSON format to any other upcoming legislation as well, and I am fairly sure that, uh, that that will happen. Or, for instance, you're a rather large hospital, maybe you have some in internal rules that uh, your, an your security analyst uh, needs to, uh, need to take care of, well then you can have a notice list on the internal hospital uh, rules, for instance. The, um, one of the most loved features are the taxonomies and the galaxies. This is basically to um, declutter the jungle of, uh, of, of random names. We give uh, some uh, threads or threat actors. Um, initially, we, invent, we, we came up with the taxonomies because we noticed that everyone had a different way of writing TLP red. So that's a traffic light protocol, and some people would write it uh, TLP dash red, others TLP colon red, others would just write red or white, and that is a pain. Uh, machines are uh, rather stupid, so basically we came up with the taxonomies where we, we would actually just define how TLP red should be written. Uh, we use a very basic uh, triple uh, tag system to achieve that, but of course everything has its limits, and once we noticed, okay, uh, triple tags are fun, but if something gets a little bit larger, like uh, a, a big uh, APT group that has uh, 50 different names because the vendors uh, were drinking very weird coffee and just really had to market up some, uh, some attacker, um, in the galaxy you can basically then more easily describe these, uh, these la larger contextualized pieces of information. Here is a very brief overview on, um, on, on how MISP actually works. In the beginning, there is an event. An event can be a little bit of everything. An event can be a, an attempted intrusion. An event can be an intrusion. Um, but mostly, an uh, event should be the, uh, the initial scaffolding to uh, describe um, what, what uh, your attributes, so your actual indicators of compromise, like IP addresses, uh, maybe banking numbers, maybe telephone numbers, are describing. And because we had distribution in mind, all 
of uh, these events can be shared with the community at large, whoever uh, is actually connected to one's MISP instance. And by having these interconnections, such an event can then be shared and extended in between all these um, connected MISP instances, um, which basically allows you to, uh, to have a very, very uh, rich network of interconnected machines that, that have um, events with, uh, with valuable information. Unfortunately, I cannot really go into the detail of, uh, of, of how it really works under the hood, but if you are interested in more information, please just send us a mail and perhaps we'll, we'll come uh, to uh, whatever organiza organization you're at to give you a, uh, a training or, uh, or a more uh, deep presentation. Um, as a side note, an attribute, so for instance, an IP address or, or anything else, um, can also only be shared on its own. Um, so basically, you don't want to share an event because maybe this has been an, uh, an internal investigation on a potential breach, but there are some uh, attributes that are interesting. Well, then you can decide, okay, I just want to share these couple of attributes with either my local community or per perhaps other interested communities uh, around your MISP instance. instance. And with that, we are at the uh, communities uh, side of things. It is extremely important um, if we want to be efficient in uh, threat information sharing that we foster these communities and that we actually do get together uh, not only within our industries but also across industries that we share these indicators of compromise. Because I don't want to break it to you, currently the bad guys are winning because um, they don't need to uh, worry about uh, tax returns and actually whether the law is legal or not. They just attack and they are very good at it. So we need to share more information in between each other, no matter which industries we are in. And on the positive side there, uh, actually the, the vendors are getting more and more interested also talking to us to include, for instance, um, their feeds. So in that sense, we also consider the vendors as a part of that community when they actually send us their feed of indicators of uh, compromise without too much of a, of a fuss. Sometimes communities have rules to, uh, uh, to, to join them, and I will just point out um, the, the first community, for instance, and the first community is a big forum of incident responders, and there, of course, because this is a trusted community, you cannot just apply to get into that community to see the information the, uh, the incident response teams are sharing. A more lax community in that sense is circ the circle community, where over um, 800 organizations are already participating uh, in not only sharing information, but also only consulting information. So if you, at this stage, don't want to share your indicators, well, then just be a leecher. Just suck out the data out of our uh, instance, take a look at it, and uh, make up your, your own mind wh whether that is actually uh, interesting data to not only consume, but perhaps you get, um, you get also um, inspired in, in sharing some of your indicators that would make sense to the community at, at large. Um, the uh, X-ISAC or the cross-ISAC is basically an effort to um, bring together these um, uh, in, information uh, sharing um, uh, centers to uh, information security uh, centers to cross uh, sector share information, but that is, it's kind of, it's kind of new and uh, we're actually quite happy to see that uh, perhaps uh, even in Australia people also have a very similar idea than that. Um, CV cert is a uh, civil cert for, uh, for basically com communities uh, like either in war zo zones or in, uh, or, or for people uh, of the press. Um, the Fidelis uh, Barncat um, da database is uh, an example where a, uh, a vendor feeds back their, um, uh, their, their feeds to, uh, uh, to MISP. I already talked a little bit about the first MISP community and of course because NATO was one of, uh, of the initial um, believers in MISP, they also still have their uh, communities. Um, I will not talk too much about feeds. A feed is just a data stream that you can ingest and then basically uh, either implement into, into your event stream in your MISP instance or only consult it to make 
fast lookups, and if you want to roll your own uh, feed to share it either with uh, connected communities or not, you can use the PyMisp feed generator. And um, so one last word, if you want to uh, play around with MISP, uh, just go to mispproject.org and there basically you can download a virtual machine that, uh, that is set up for, uh, for, your, uh, uh, for your usage. You just log in and it basically, uh, it basically just, just works. Um, and with that, I hand it over to Michael. Thank you, Steve. So, um Last year we were here to make a talk about MISP. Uh, is somebody in the audience who was there too? Oh, at least a few. That's very nice, yes. So last year we stated out that one of the most important features missing are objects. So what we have so far, before, you have your events and in your events you have the possibility to encode your information, your data, your IOCs with attributes. Yes, for example, here we have attributes for IP addresses, and we have a suspicious domain name. We have www.circle.lu. It's a very suspicious website. Uh, so this was already quite powerful and useful, but something was mis missing, yes? We miss the context in between. For example, the information which IP address is now directly related with those uh, host name. So now with the objects which are implemented now, we have those possibilities. You know, we can create, in this case, we created an IP port object, and this object includes the IP address, the host name, even the port, and we see that they belong together. So we created the context in between. To create the object in MISP is quite simple because there are templates. There are templates for all kinds of objects. And uh, on the menu, on the left side, you have the option Add Object, which brings you to a selection of objects. In this case, I select the email object. And in the email object, I have the usual possibility to make the usual email fields, for example, reply to or from, or email body, and so on, and to enter my content into these fields. So it's quite easy to create those objects. You also can add some metadata, you can add some comments, and you can fine-tune your distribution level. It's even uh, possible to create your own objects and this is quite easy because these are simple JSON files. Probably if you're keen with, uh, known with MISP, you already see how taxonomies, how galaxies, and warning lists are defined. So it's all in JSON files. And also for the objects, you can, oops, <laughs> you can create your own definition. So keep the finger away. Um, you can go on the GitHub site to see what kind of objects are already predefined. It's round about, or I would say even more than 60 objects are def defined right now. And you see the basic skeleton of the object template. You can add your name, you create a UUID, and you have the possibility to define what attributes you like to have in your object. You even can define which of the attributes are required. And you can find you in this. Well, now with the objects, we have some new possibilities. Um, imagine the situation like we have it here. We have an object about a file. We have the file name. We had the hashes, the MD5, SIJ1, and so on. And we have an object about IP, an IP object. Our IP source object with our suspicious website, yes? And now we like to put the information in place and say, this malicious file was dropped by this website. 
So we can set up a, rel a relation between the objects. Yes, you see here in the object description, we created a small relation that this file was dropped by this website. We create some additional relations here. They are not visible because the attributes are above. We say, for example, that several IP addresses are affected. Several internal IP addresses are affected. Now, the information is there, but it looks not very human readable at this point. So there is some new feature, which is called the, the event graph viewer, which is the visual representation of the rela uh, relations between the objects. Oops. So I should keep this away. <laughs> No, I need it. So we, we easily see that there is a lay relation between the two objects, that this file gets dropped by this IP object, and that there are some internal IP addresses which are affected by this website because they access this website. You have very much possibilities to find you in the graphical representation. Just, by example, I expand in this view the objects to have a few of the attributes inside the objects. You can rearrange the stuff, you can make hierarchical view, tree view, and if you like to edit, add or delete some information, some objects, some attributes or some references, you must not go back to the text representation, you even can do it inside those viewer directly. And, well, the, the cool thing here is, uh, w with the objects, because you can uh, define them as you wish, you first of all don't need to wait uh, um, on us to come up with a new object. So if you see something new that can be objectified, you just um, add it, and um, mostly because you have the correlation system behind, you can easily then see, okay, this newly created object, does that correlate with anything? Um, and that might actually give you a better insight into, uh, into your uh, current uh, threat landscape within, within your organization, whether uh, what, what the new stuff you have seen, whether that is actually relevant, and you can perhaps even make conclusions on how this relates to, uh, to other things you have seen in the past to um, a, at least do some kind of, uh, of attribution. <coughs> So MIS basically is a platform which supports cooperation between organizations, between communities, and you see events of third parties. Now imagine there's a third party, they have an event, they created an event, and you say, oh, I have exactly the same stuff in my company. But ah, I see, I find out some more information. I find out some additional IP address, some additional uh, files with hash values, and your idea is now to enrich those events with your information. So before, you had the possibility to make a proposal. You propose to the event, I have additional information, and the third party then had the possibility to say, oh yeah, that's great, I accept this, and to enrich their event with your information. Or they just, just say, no, I don't care, or even they don't read your proposal. So that's tricky. Um, because you do not have the possibility to modify their event. And you also do not like to copy-paste all the data, create your new event, and copy-paste all the existing data into this event. So now we have a new possibility to create extended events. And in the extended events, basically you create your own event, and you say this event extends an existing event. Um, and you just have to add the UUID of this existing event. Then you can create your own objects and your own attributes as usual, and you never touch the original data, and you keep full control of your own data. This is the view when you create an event in the GUI, because uh, you can do everything with the API, but the GUI is a little bit more visible. That's why it's usable for the presentation. So you can, uh, this is the view when you create a, uh, usually a common event with the, 
with the GUI. And here you have now the new, free, uh, uh, the new field extended event where we copy the UUID of the existing event. And we already immediately see a preview. So we create event 183 here and we like to extend event 182. Now after we created the event, we add our own attributes here in this example. We added, let me see, we added a link to a virus total page and we added some internal ticket reference number. Just an example. And we have the information that this event extends the event 1A2 here. This is a kind of an atomic view. We just see our data at this level, but you see the small magnifying glass here next to those information. If you push that button, then we see we, we switch to the extended view and we see the full blown event with our data along with the existing data of the other event. Also, the original event get enriched with the information that there is now an extension of this event. And as soon as we share back our, our uh, as soon as we share back our, uh, our extension with the third party, they can even also access those information. And they can switch to the extended view. One thing we, we haven't uh, fully shown now is uh, the capability to, um, to include uh, third-party uh, modules, uh, third-party tools via the enrichment system. Uh, for instance, uh, here we have the example of, uh, of a ticketing system. Um, if you have like any ticketing system that might be able to enrich this particular, particular event, um, you could just very easily write a module that goes and queries your internal ticketing system, whatever it is, and then just um, enriches the current event with information from that ticketing system. For uh, incident responders out there, we basically uh, have very tight integration with uh, uh, a software called The Hive, um, which has a, a enrichment system called Cortex, and basically, the uh, Cortex enrichment system is compatible with MISP, and the MISP module system uh, of enrichments is compatible uh, with, with the Hive. Um, and why is that important? Um, not because the Hive is great, but because then you, you have a very good example how um, integration already works. So if you have your, your, your own um, system you want to integrate, you now already have a, a, a good, uh, basically, a good template on how you could uh, make make it make it happen. Um, in in essence, and um, in sort of conclusion, um, this is all rather new. Uh, we haven't been sharing that much data in such an open fashion for very long. So as we together go on this path of sharing indicators, um, we should we should sort of. Uh, work together and also fail together. Um, and that's also a thing. A lot of people uh, ask us, okay, yeah, but what if, what if I, I leak data? Um, well, it might happen. Sometimes people make mistakes. Um, but then at least you can already think now how you would actually mitigate uh, su such a leak. And as you've seen, we have quite a few uh, uh, checks to, to prevent uh, such a leak of happening, but you know, shit happens sometimes. And so in, in, in conclusion, yeah, please share your indicators because um, everyone 
can then actually uh, benefit from it. And if you want to get more uh, more involved in uh, in the MISP project, just uh, either come to uh, the MISP Summit, which is this uh, rather large event where all uh, MISP communities that are interested actually uh, come down to Luxembourg and where we sh share uh, our ongoing developments. Um, and uh, by, uh, by chance, it happens also during the Hack.lu conference, which is um, it's basically uh, very similar uh, to this conference, a part that we only have 400 people because we are a small country. Um, but um, the, the big uh, advantage there is because it is so small, you actually get to talk with, uh, with most of the, of the people who, who present there. And um, I would gladly take your, uh, your criticism, your questions, your doubts, um, your praise, and um, we thank you. Thank you very much, Steve and Michael. Um, now, there weren't any questions submitted via the application, so if there are any questions from the floor, just raise your hand and I'll run, and I'll run straight over. No? Um, I, yeah. I've, I've always wanted... Oh, sorry. I saw you guys um, in the download section, you have uh, availability for Ubuntu, CentOS, and a few other Linux distros. Does will it work on Red Hat or... Will, Sorry? Because it works on CentOS, will it work on Red Hat? Uh, it, it will work on Red Hat. Um, there is only one issue with the enterprise systems, and especially CentOS and Red Hat. Um, if you want to install Python 3, all of a sudden you have broken a very weird license agreement with, uh, with the company that you are now installing very bad and unsupported software, which honestly is fairly ridiculous because the Python clock says in one year and a couple of months, Python 2 will be not maintained anymore. Um, thus, you could even argue it's already now sort of a security risk. Uh, that's a problem, but um, that's also the reason why we still have some Python 2 functionality uh, w within the, the, the core of, uh, of, of MIS. Were there any other questions? Were there, there we go. Thanks. Um, I'm interested, do any of your communities, do you have any processes or best practices for managing reputation? Um, you know, and data quality, like, you know, you want to make sure that you're not taking action on questionable intelligence effectively. Does that, does that kind of evolve within the communities? Do you have processes? What does that look like? We, we, we have a standard um, that sort of tries to describe these uh, best practices, but um, it, it, it kind of c comes by, by actually living it and doing it. It's like, how, how do you foster a... Uh, uh, a security-minded uh, community, um, uh, society, while you live it, and you just sort of see what works for you, because um, you don't want to sort of restrict yourself too much either. The best thing, really, is to reach out to someone in the community, and I cannot stress that more. Just, just ask, um, either on the conference, so how are you guys doing it, uh, what, what were your lessons learned, and of course you can also ask us, we have quite a lot of experience of course in the, uh, in the incident uh, re response field, um, and uh, maybe we can actually put you in touch with uh, someone uh, in one of the financial communities, because um, I, I, they are also uh, getting very, uh, very active, and they even have more legal obligations to sort of have um, some rules set even on paper to, to, to oblige to whatever uh, local uh, law is, is in place. So I would say reach out to the community, definitely, yeah. Were there any other questions from the floor? All right. So um, oh, okay. I oh. There's one in the back. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, ask, oh, I'll ask, <laughs> ask my question first and then hand over to him. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned its integration with Hive. Uh, are you familiar with Request Tracker by Best Practical, otherwise known as RT? Just wondering where, how well it integrates with that. Yeah, we use it. <laughs> we actually, in, in, the, in our set, we use, uh, we use RT, but we have, unfortunately, no integration because, um, well, we don't really have uh, neither the manpower nor the knowledge to uh, do the integration ourselves. 
And so far, we didn't really have the need because there is the Hive, and we might eventually just switch to the Hive. So we haven't really pursued the, uh, uh, the um, yeah, the, the area of, uh, of RT. But I do know for a fact that perhaps this hosting organization is also taking a very deep look into RT MISP integration. Um, and Best Practical, who are the people behind it, they, they can, of course, do it for monies. Um, but, um, yeah, there's, but there's nothing uh, uh, very... Uh, concrete going on yet. Um, we've got this deployed in another one of my MUs and we're looking to put it out in the ANZ market. And I was just curious, can you run it internally? As in two MISPs will talk and share data that's possibly I don't want to push out, but yeah. then take feeds and feed data out as well. Yeah, so yeah. can you do internal as well as not just making it fully public? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's no problem. You you basically create a sync uh, connection, so you oh, okay. you synchronize two MISPs up, yep. and the um, the challenging thing there is that uh, you need someone with uh, w with enough knowledge to set this uh, synchronization up because you can even filter up to attribute level. So you can say, okay, these attributes they are not allowed to sync, or you uh, you say, I just want to sync. Um, uh, data with the attribute TLP white, for instance, right. um, or I just want to sync these uh, these galaxies and so on and so forth. So that that is really where where the the human factor comes in. And then also, yeah, please train your staff. Very important. It's this is not a tool where you just install it and then it all will magically happen. And it's it is to a certain point intuitive, but how are you going to use the tool? That's, that's a different story. You have to learn that stuff. It's a Swiss pocket knife and, um, well, if you don't know how to properly use it, you might just cut yourself. Righty. Were there any other questions from the floor? I think we've got time for one more. Um, for those that didn't catch Mike's talk yesterday, he was discussing this, with, as, as you mentioned just then. Um, it, will, it was recorded, so if you want to catch it, there will be some integration with also and myths. So. Um, I won't go into it because I'll probably just butcher it and there was a whole presentation about it. But um, yeah, there is some, some integration there. So a um, round of applause for Steve and Mike. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And there's just one last remark. Um, if, if some people are from Europe or so, because we are a um, European Union funded project, um, we, have, uh, we are funded to actually go to um, institutions and give free trainings, as in free. You, you might just need to pay us a hotel, but that's, uh, even that is negotiable. So yeah, and also if you're in the Asia Pacific region, I uh, live in Tokyo, so if you have any needs in this area, you can always reach out to me, and um, maybe I can come to your uh, place and we make an open MISP training where other uh, people also can join, because um, that's the basic idea. I, we do it for free, but it needs to be open to the world, um, or your partners or whatever. Anyway, thanks. It's fantastic. Um, so, oh yeah.